welcome back to another Teardown Tuesday. Today we're taking a look at a pressure reducing valve like you might find in a booster heater installation for a dish machine. And this particular pressure reducing valve or PRV you can see on the label has a very low operating range. It can only run 10 to 35 psi, it comes preset at 20 psi and then you can also see here it's stamped three-quarter for the threads. And that three-quarter is referring to the threaded inlet and outlet. So these are three-quarter NPT. The, the way this would typically be installed, it would sit before the booster heater and reduce the pressure down before the water enters the booster. And by reducing the pressure, we also slow the flow through that booster and give the water more time to absorb heat. If we ran into this in the field, for whatever reason, and had to make an adjustment, that's what this top bolt is. Top bolt can be turned to adjust for more or less pressure. If we want to increase the output pressure, we would thread this in. And if we want to decrease the output pressure, we would thread it out. So taking a look at it, let's see what we can see before we take it apart. Uh, this was a used unit. It's been in service. There's tape, pipe dope on the threads, and it also looks like it leaked at one, at one point. But when we take a look here, there's not a lot of corrosion on the inside. There's a little bit, but, but not a ton. So it probably wasn't in service for too long, and it certainly wasn't left leaking for too long. Uh, the union adapter here seals with an O-ring, and that just fell out there. And that's so this thing can be serviced at some point in the future. If you had it hard piped with threaded fittings on both sides, it'd be very hard to service later. Uh, we've got our data plate tag up here. And we've got Torx. And we've got Torx bolts holding the entire assembly together. So I'm thinking here, let's go ahead and pull the top off here. I expect there'll be a spring in here and and that's what we've been adjusting there. But let's get those out first and take a look. All right, so as we loosen these up, we can see this has got some spring tension on it. And it's a pretty significant amount of spring tension. So before we take these the rest of the way out, we're going to back this bolt out and take as much of that spring tension off as we can. There's a pretty good size spring in there. All right, so you can see it was a pretty long bolt but it has now taken all the spring pressure off so we can pull those last two bolts out without any risk. All right, so this is the top cap or cover and you can see some of the rust around the edges there where it was leaking. We've got our little cup that our, our bolt was threaded into pushing down on the spring, and it is a, a pretty stout spring. It's pretty, pretty strong. Then we've got a gasket with a diaphragm assembly. We've got this nut, some sealing surfaces here. I think what we'll do next is actually pop this cap to make sure that there's not another end to this fastener that we can grab a hold of. Oh, I found another spring. So inside that cap was a, another small spring. And then there's a, a slotted assembly here. 
This whole thing is not moving, and I feel like it should be. I wonder if that's why this was replaced. Let's go ahead and pull this part of the assembly apart. This really doesn't look too bad. It's not hard, it's not cracked. There's that little bit of rust around the edge, but I don't, I don't see any obvious damage to it. That looks totally fine, little Teflon washer. I, uh, I'm really wondering if this is supposed to be moving and it's not, and that's why this was replaced. Yeah, that, that's really stuck. Yeah, so it does move that. I, I think that was our failure. This thing was just stuck. Wow, that thing's still really stuck. When we talk about characteristics of water, one of the big characteristics is uh, pH, or, or how corrosive that water is going to be. And it looks like wherever this thing was installed, the water was just really corrosive, really acidic maybe. And you can see how that's turned this brass inside into this corroded green oxide layer, I guess. And that oxide has, has expanded out and created this, this powdery stuff that has jammed the entire mechanism. So this thing was stuck. It was not pressure reducing at all. So I think we got that started. It's starting to come apart. Yeah. So I think we just had so much corrosion that this thing seized up. So that's the lower part. Here's the upper part. Yeah, so it looks like Looks like our ceiling surface and the areas around it got so corroded that they just seized, they locked up. That's really impressive. Very aggressive water, wherever this thing came from. This particular PRV is supposed to have a bypass function, and I'm wondering if these small holes are part of that bypass function. So we got the seal off. There's like a very small valve down inside. Hmm. I have to come back to that. So let's take a look here the way the flow pattern through this valve is set up. So the water comes in on this end. We go through this section of the valve. And then our water is applied into the middle of this opening. So it's coming through right about here, where this little spool would have been sitting. So the water would have come in to the portion under this little spool. Let's actually pull that off too and see what's in there. Oh, inlet strainer. Stainless. That looks good. Yeah, so the water would come in, go through this strainer, then go to the spool valve. That looks like a feedback port to our diaphragm here. So this spool should have been able to move up and down in this pocket but it couldn't because of all the corrosion. So it was pulling this up to close this passage off underneath. So as the pressure rose, it would pull the spool valve up. The, the bleed port here would feed water pressure in under the diaphragm. 
would lift this spool up and eventually pull this shut. And that would stop our flow. But now if we had thermal expansion on this side, I am looking, I'm not seeing a... A lot of times they would drill a little port or a check valve here, but I'm not seeing that in this particular valve. I'm wondering though if when this thing was in the closed position, this was the bleed port here and it was bleeding back through into the inlet side through that tiny little bleed port. And I bet that's what it was doing. There's like a little tiny check valve or something down inside this. But I can't quite get it apart to see how it goes. Yeah, so I tried to clamp this and spin it apart, but I think it is all one piece. I don't see a way to get the little check apart, but I'm I'm thinking that's what the little check is doing or the little block that's down in there is doing is it's giving this a, a passage for thermal expansion, but preventing preventing the pressure from going the other way. So for instance, if we had 50 PSI incoming and we were trying to get 20 PSI out, we wouldn't want this to bleed the pressure from the incoming. So I think there's like a little spool in here that can slide back and forth. And that way, when you have 20 PSI back here, but it starts rising from the thermal expansion of the water in the booster, that water can push into this inside of this spool, slide that little block down enough to uncover that port and bleed back into the incoming water side. So it's just a, a real tiny pressure relief But yeah, this, this is not very old, it looks like at least, but the, the water is so aggressive that it just corroded that, that bore down in there. All right, so when we talk about principles that are used here, we're talking about force over area. So we have the area of the diaphragm against the force of the water. So that creates this push up and that's why we use this big spring to counter that. And we also have the same principle at play down on the bottom here, but because we have a much smaller surface area, we use a much smaller spring to overcome that. And then these two springs, when this whole stack is put together, would balance each other out. So when the stack was all put together, this little spool would slide back and forth to regulate that pressure. These things are really simple, but it's interesting to look at how they fail, because these really should have a long life if the water isn't too aggressive. So it's interesting to see how aggressive that water was. The, the most common failures with these are these diaphragms getting hard, getting brittle, and then cracking through and you can see that they, they start to get these impressions from the, the pressure of the assembly squeezing and they'll start to eventually crack through around these corners and edges where that pressure is making them thin. But this one's still very flexible, very pliable. And it, it, it hasn't been in service that long. Uh, other failures you might see on this, you, you may run into seal failures like the, the O-rings here on the ceiling surfaces. And if you take a look here at the way that this is starting to, to get these chunks embedded in it, eventually these chunks will cause leak paths to form. And this one may have already gotten to that point. And those leak paths will prevent this from being able to regulate pressure. It'll try, it'll pull itself closed except that leak path will allow the incoming water pressure to continue to seep past and you'll see the, the pressure just slowly creep up with a failure like that. Uh, a lot of these valves have rebuild kits that you can get, but usually the amount of time it takes to find and order a rebuild kit isn't worth it for this kind of valve. You just put a replacement in. Yeah, you can see that seal's real soft back here, but it's starting to get hard where it was up against the metal surface. Yeah, 
And it looks like in this particular valve, they have an insert pressed in here or threaded in here for that to squeeze shut against to give it a little more chance than if it were just pulling tight against the metal. Other thing to keep in mind is you do have these inlet screener, these inlet screens, strainers, and you can pull garbage down the water line and get them caught in these screens, and then it will look like the valve's not working because you've you've got a restriction there. So the the dish machine will call for water flow, but instead of getting full flow, you'll see the pressure fall way down. And you'll try to adjust this, but won't be able to get it high enough. And, and chances are you have some kind of inlet restriction. But that's it. This is a pretty fast one. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Hi, folks. My name is Jack Kell, and I'm a senior technical trainer for SmartCare. The video you've just watched is part of a larger series of technical training videos we make available to our technicians at SmartCare. If you found this interesting and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. I'll be releasing a new component teardown video every Tuesday in 2022. If you're already a smart care technician and you have a part that you'd like to see me tear down, please reach out to me internally for shipping instructions. If you're not a smart care technician, but you or someone you know would like to learn more about a career as a service technician specializing in commercial restaurant equipment, please check out our open positions at www.smartcaresolutions.com forward slash careers. Thanks for watching.